Segment 24, Triangulation and Parallax. We've seen all along in this course that we can't measure the third dimension, that is the distance that objects are away from us very easily. In the solar system, we use radar to get the distance to Venus and then use Kepler's laws to get the distances to the other planets. But even the most nearby star, we can't bounce radar off of, and if we could, it would take many years for the signal to get back to us. So this is not a practical way to go about measuring distances. We need another scheme to measure that radial distance. We can measure the the position on the sky with very high precision, but the radial distance eludes us. Now why do we need to do this? We need to do this because we want to be able to measure the intrinsic properties of the objects. Intrinsic properties are properties that are inherent to the object that don't depend on its location or its velocity. Observed properties, on the other hand, are ones you can measure. They may vary depending on the relationship between the measure's frame of reference and that of the object. That is, they may depend on where you are or how fast you're moving. So what are some of the intrinsic properties of stars? Well, we have mass, how, how much material is in the star altogether, radius, how big the star is, temperature, how hot the outer surface of the star is, composition, what the star is made of, which elements and in what abundance are present, and age, how old the star is. All of these are quantities that are independent of where you are when you're looking at the star or how fast you're moving when you're looking at the star or where the star is with relationship to you. So these are intrinsic to the star. They are inherent in its very nature. The observed properties, however, are the things that you can actually measure and we have to get from one to the other. So observed properties, the spectrum of the star, the color or colors of the star, the Doppler shift, of the of the radiation from the star is seen by the shift of its lines. Its proper motion, that is, how fast its position on the sky is changing, its position on the sky, and its distance. Of these quantities, the distance is normally the one that's the most difficult to measure, and that's what we'll be talking about here. On Earth, we can do a, a form of parallax by doing triangulation. So, for example, if we wanted to measure the distance to a tree on the opposite side of a stream, we could lay out a baseline between two points, A and B, and we could measure the angle between the line between A and B and the position of the tree at each vertex, at vertex A and at vertex B. And by doing so, and doing a bit of elementary trigonometry, we could then measure the distance d without actually having to pace it off. As long as we knew the baseline length and those two angles, we could use uh, geometry and then some trigonometric relations to calculate the length of the distance from the baseline to the tree on the opposite side of the river, even though we couldn't get there. In space, we can do more or less the same thing. We measure parallax by comparing nearby and distant stars' positions from the opposite sides of the Earth's orbit. You can do a simulation of this in, in, in your own home. If you hold up your, your hand at, at about half of full extension and just put your thumb up and hold it up in front of a light, close one eye, block the light with your thumb, and then close that eye and open the other eye. And you'll notice that your thumb moves off of the position of the light. If you now extend your arm fully and do the same thing, start first with one eye and then the other, You'll see the same thing happen, but you'll notice that your thumb won't move as far along the ceiling when you do that. And that's because when the object's more distant, the angular change as you change your point of view along the baseline between your two eyes is not as large. We use the baseline of the Earth's orbit and measure the position of a star against the distant field stars, stars that are very far away, and see how much that star shifts. The closer the object is to us, the more the shift will be because the larger the angle that's formed by it, by that vertex of the triangle where the Earth's orbit is the base. So we define a quantity called the parsec, which is the distance at which an object would have a parallax of one arc second, one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. That distance happens to be equal to 3.26 light years where we define the baseline as the distance from the Earth to the Sun, 1 AU. So 1 parsec is 206,265 AU. That's the distance that an object is if it has a parallax of 1 
arcsecond. The thing is that the parallax of objects goes down as their distance goes up. So the parallax is equal to 1 over the distance in parsec. So for example, an object at 1 parsec has a parallax of 1 arc a second, but an object at 10 parsecs has a parallax of a tenth of an arc second. An object at 100 parsecs has a parallax of a hundredth of an arc second. Now, this would all be simple except for a, a, a problem. It would just be a question of precision. The problem is that don't, stars don't sit still waiting to get measured. Many of them move with respect to the sun. Because the influence of the center of the galaxy and nearby stars is so small, you can consider the motion for, for almost at almost any level of accuracy to be straight line motion. The objects are just moving with respect to each other. And so take, for example, the, the asterism that we know is the Big Dipper. Right now, it looks very Dipper-like. But if you t take the measured proper motions of the stars in the Dipper, they're not all in the same direction at the same speed. And about a million years ago, it looked very different. The upper illustration shows that. And about 100,000 years from now, the lip of the Dipper will have opened up and the handle will have bent down. This is all due to the effects of, of proper motion, the difference in the directions and speed at which these objects are going. This proper motion can have the effect of masking out the parallax that we want to measure. Here again, we're going to go through this exercise of now, instead of looking at the system from outside, think of what we see on the sky, just as we did when we were talking about Kepler and the planets and using Tycho's observations. So in the top illustration, we have a star with no proper motion. That's the red star. And as you look at it, first at time zero, it's to the right of the upper left of the distant stars. And then because of the effects of parallax, six months later, when the Earth's on the opposite side of the sun, the star appears to have moved to the left of that star in the upper left-hand diagram. Six months after that, at 12 months, it'll be back where it started from. And then 18 months later, it'll shift back again. This is all due to the Earth's motion around the Sun. If in addition to that small parallax, the star had a large proper motion, most of what you would see would be its motion from left to right, in this case, in the bottom set of frames, across the sky. The parallax would be there, but it would be buried underneath this secular motion, this motion from one place to another. So how do we pull those apart? The trick you can use is to look at what happens at 6 and 12 months intervals. At 12 month intervals, the parallax position is exactly the same. So by looking at the difference in position every 12 months, you can measure pure proper motion. Once you know this proper motion, you can take it out of the measurements taken every six months, and what's left then is the parallax motion. That then allows you to measure the parallax even in the presence of this proper motion. Historically, the absence of stellar parallax was used by the Greeks as an argument against the heliocentric model. The idea being if the Earth were moving, you ought to see the, the parallax of the stars. Why was this argument not valid? Well, because stars are so far away that even the nearest have no parallax when viewed with the naked eye. You can't see this effect with your own eye. But with modern astronomical equipment, we can determine the distance to objects uh, using parallax out to about 500 parsecs from the ground, a bit less. But with, with precise satellites, we can measure out to a distance of almost 500 parsecs. But the best distances we get are for clusters of objects rather than for single stars. Why is this? Because we can combine the measurements for many stars and the random errors in determining the parallax of the individual stars would tend to cancel. And this allows us to get a more accurate average. So parallax, as we've seen, is a tool for measuring the distances to objects and it works out to, to a at most about the distance of the Orion Nebula. So even within our own galaxy, we'll have to come up with other methods for measuring distances across the galaxy and for other objects throughout the galaxy. When we get to, to galaxies outside of our own, it becomes utterly impossible to, to do parallax measurements. And there we're dependent on other means for getting the distance.